Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, now we can have our talk. Uh, hi, this is us. Um, I'm Adam, Dirk, Will, Chris, and we, uh, we're happy to be here and talk to you guys about um, our experience creating immersive VR worlds. Um, we've got uh, a little introduction, and then uh, each of us is going to do um, less than five minute kind of micro talk, and then we're just going to have an open discussion, and then we'll leave plenty of time uh, at the end for for questions. So um, let's jump right into it. So I like to uh, infuse music into my talks somehow all the time, and if you hadn't picked it up, it's in the title of this talk. Um, Use Your Illusion, the, uh, the, the epic double album, uh, Guns N' Roses, released from 1991. So I thought I'd just give you guys a little Guns N' Roses uh, trivia real quick. Uh, both of those, these albums were released on September 17th, 1991. They both debuted at number two. Uh, one sold 685,000. Two sold 770,000, and interestingly enough, the second album spawned all of the hits for this double album release. You Could Be Mine, November Rain, and Don't Cry. Both of these albums uh, represented a lyrical, songwriting, stylistic growth from the kind of previous turning point for the band, the seminal Appetite for Destruction. Uh, these albums had a more mature sound, despite many of the songs originating back to the more raw Appetite for Destruction era. Uh, despite the global success of these albums and their tour, um, the double albums ended up splintering and destroying the band, specifically alienating guitarist Izzy Stradlin, who was kind of the songwriting engine of the group, and he left and it kind of just eroded the band. Their next album was a album of covers called The Spaghetti Incident that no one remembers. And then, well, you know the rest. I guess they're back now, kind of. Uh, so cautionary tale about double albums, guys. <laughs> and excess, maybe in video games. So that what works. Uh, so we're here today to talk about uh, kind of immersive worlds and how they're achievable in VR. And for me, and for these guys, and probably for many of you out there, the first time you put on a VR headset, if it was a good experience, it really kind of changed how you look at, at things. And we want to share uh, our experience making VR worlds and what we've learned and kind of what we think works and what doesn't. But you know, I look at I look at something like this, and it's kind of the uh, the possibility, and I want to go to there. Uh, so I'm Adam Orth. Uh, I'm the creative strategist at First Contact Entertainment. Um, I've been making video games for a long time, and uh, I'm starting my 18th year making games now. Um, and about five or six years ago, maybe even a little bit earlier, I started becoming really bored with the traditional way of making games and the kind of minimal um, medium progression uh, between long development cycles. And I was becoming embittered and just hostile towards the whole thing. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. And I was just searching for whatever, whatever the new thing was. Like, how am I going to express myself in this interactive medium and I just didn't know what to do and I was just really kind of stuck in a rut and I started working on this game called Adrift which is uh, it's a VR game if you haven't uh, heard of it look it up it's pretty sweet um, but I I kind of considered this uh, moment a, a career and life reset for me and it just started as a way for me to just try to do something new and different, and I wanted to tell a really deeply personal story in an interactive experience, but not, you know, through shooting someone in the face in a video game. So, around that time, 
uh, right around that time, the Kickstarter for Oculus Rift happened, and my partner and I were backers, we were early backers, and we had a very basic prototype for a drift, and we got this DK1, and we magically somehow set it up, and it worked the first time, which never happened again after that. <laughs> um, and so the first time I saw this, this new generation of VR was with something that I was building, and I just lost my mind. It, 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 like, it changed everything for me, and I realized that this was the thing that I was searching for, and I instantly knew that I could tell the story that I wanted to tell with this new hardware and technology. It was just kind of mind-blowing. So we put those two, mashed them together, and you know, Adrift was kind of a traditional game experience up until that moment, and um, we put it all together, and then it just, everything kind of fell together for us. Um, completely creatively re-energized, just totally into exploring in the dark and peering around. So that little prototype in the Oculus Rift became this, but, but in VR. Um, and it was just the perfect way to really express what we, were, what we were trying to get, and we just had never experienced anything like that before. Um, a drift, for, at least for, for us, was the perfect setting for VR. It was, it was this kind of seductive and, and universal power of space that kind of resonates with everyone, because everyone knows what space is, and they have their own idea, and they're either excited by it or scared by it, but everyone has kind of a foundation to build on, and it really kind of, everything just kind of lined up right there, and it's just, it took me someplace that I could never go in real life, and, and uh, that's when I really kind of saw the power of VR, and I became one of those kind of early adopters and uh, evangelists for the tech, and um, we basically worked with Oculus kind of from the beginning, not in any kind of official capacity, just we loved what they were doing and they loved what we were doing. And, uh, you know, we ended up becoming a featured Oculus Rift launch title and, and that first wave with the Vive. And uh, it was just an awesome experience to be part of. And currently I'm working at uh, First Contact Entertainment. We're a AAA VR studio in Santa Monica. Uh, my role as creative strategist is to kind of guide the vision of all of our VR products and the creative vision anyway, and uh, ensure that that kind of strategy is moving forward safely in the future and then creating new, new experiences as well. Um, I'm focusing now on multiplayer VR. Uh, Drift was a very kind of solo, closed off experience and um, I want to take my passion of um, the virtual space and bring other people into it and do awesome things. So that's what we're doing. Now Dirk. Oh. <coughs> Switching, what are we doing? Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Dirk van Welden. I'm from Belgium. I'm uh, the captain at uh, Eye Illusions, and uh, we made uh, this game called Space Pirate Trainer. I know who, who has played Space Pirate Trainer before. Yeah, it's uh, cool. It's a lot of people. <laughs> so yeah, I'm the founder and project lead uh, on Space Pirate Trainer. Um, Eye Illusions was actually uh, we're doing work for hire for. Uh, uh, the entertainment industry and the communication industry, so we're creating games for fairs. Um, um, and then we ended up creating our own IP like four years ago on Steam pretty early. Um, by that time, we had some contacts at, at Valve and we had a, a Vive pretty early. Um, um, my current role at, at, at iIllusions is mostly uh, gameplay programming. I'm an interaction freak, which is great for VR because there's a lot of interaction going on. It's about subtleties in, in movement and subtleties in the way you grab things and, and so that make uh, experiences better. I've been a very early VR supporter, so I was also a backer for uh, Oculus. Uh, but my problem was I played, uh, the first thing I played on there was uh, Half-Life in VR. And I'm super susceptible to motion sickness and I'm just love. Went, went to bed for a couple of hours and I actually said to myself, I'm never going to create a VR game. So that's something I actually said. Um, 
two years after or three years afterwards, uh, I got noticed, like I got the Vive and tried it on and I was blown away because I wasn't getting uh, motion sick, mainly because of the positional tracking. So um, this is one of the uh, screenshots of 1.0 Space Pipe Trainer. So we're creating um, actually environments around the current environment. There's, uh, some more stuff coming uh, with 1.0, which is going to release uh, in next month. So it started out as a room scale demo. So we actually made Spacefire Trainer for Vive and for room scale. Um, it was a free demo. It was released on the forums like in December before uh, the Vive came out, and, and just because it was some, there was nothing like a shooter even. So we had one demo with a bow, and that was it. So we just tried to create something new, and back then. The wave shooter was actually something new that no one had done. <laughs> I know there's a lot of uh, wave-based shooters now. But I think uh, Spacefire Trainer was one of the first ones. Um, so uh, was Spacefire Trainer uh, uh, a success? Um, well, it sold more than 150,000 units. So we can um, we're only a tree of uh, a team of three people. So actually, for us, it was also a commercial success, next to being just great to work on. Um, one of the reasons why it became a success is probably because it's very pick up and play. Like uh, you get most of the stuff immediately. You can just start. It's super easy. You just have the shield on your back that people will show you. Um, someone like uh, Dan Kaminsky on Twitter said, my favorite part of Space Pirate Trainer is that you get access to everything immediately. So you couldn't actually, if you create a game for just desktop PCs, you can't imagine a game where you get everything instantly. Normally, you should unlock things and stuff like that. But I believe like in this first wave that we had of, of uh, VR uh, entertainment, it was a good decision that we just unlocked everything for everyone so people could just show uh, stuff. And we're trying to keep that um, strategy for 1.0 as well. And it's very difficult because if you give everything at the same time, it gets kind of overwhelming. But yeah, that's something you have to figure out. Uh, one of the reasons why it's uh, very popular in VR arcades is also the same thing. You get everything immediately, and people don't have to unlock stuff. This is another screenshot of uh, 1.0. Uh, it shows a bus fight uh, with the bus bigger than the platform. It's pretty uh, crazy in VR, uh, not so much in 2D. But yeah. So that's upcoming uh, mid-October. Um, so about uh, environments, um, so one of the decisions we made is um, you have one environment, right? So it's very open. Uh, the thing is you want to create an environment that people want to look at constantly. Um, but like if you have a corridor and there's something at the corner, people would actually love to check it out. And if you don't have any locomotion system, like people are always in the same place and running out in the same square meters, you have to create stuff that's interesting. And that's something that you have to look for. Like you, you, you have to make sure that people aren't feeling that they're missing out stuff that's happening around that world. So we try to move the action around the player. Also, like with the other screenshot that you saw, we actually move a spaceship or a big spaceship around the whole platform. So it feels like a totally different environment just by checking and changing the, and the stuff. And you didn't you have to use uh, locomotion. So that's one of the things we did. Also, um, the reason why. And the front side of Space Pirate Train is pretty empty, it's just a city with some skylights. It's, it's uh, mostly a distraction uh, issue. Like if you have too many spaceships flying around or if, if you have too much detail, you actually can see the little droids flying towards you. So you have to be careful if, uh, if you're adding too much content to the thing you have to focus on, things get uh, distracted quite easily. Also, there's object interaction that was pretty uh, important for us. So uh, people love to interact with stuff. And if everything is at a certain distance and you can't use a locomotion, you have to find some solutions. So we had a vault on. It's kind of um, a device where you can grab droids with and you actually pull them towards you. Uh, we're going to, even in 1.0, we're using it for uh, powering up uh, turrets and stuff. So we're actually adding interaction with objects that are actually far away. So was one of the solutions. Um, and then the final point is, um, so you have, uh, actually, Space Pirate Train is only using 210 degrees of, uh, of action. So most of the action is going out in front of you. And that wasn't always the case. Like in the first prototypes, it was just droids flying around you, and you would go nuts because you just can't remember all the droids and where they are and how they're flying around. So we, that was a design decision that uh, people felt so much secure, so much more secure if everything was happening in front of them. 
Um, so that's one of, uh, it's probably one of the better decisions we made for space flight training because people that's, that are in VR for the first time, you just don't want to overwhelm them. They can look around and they can see the environment, but the action should be like in front of them. So I think that's uh, most of stuff I had to say about space flight training. I'm just going to give word to uh, Will Smith. Hi everybody, I'm, oh wow, I'm loud. Uh, I'm Will Smith, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of FooVR, uh, and before that I, uh, I ran, uh, we, we, we make the Foo Show, uh, among other things. So the Foo Show uh, was an early prototype that we built to show how our animation technology works. Um, what we do is actually animate believable human avatars using the three points of data that you get from a VR headset and hand controllers, like uh, Vive and the two hand controllers or the Oculus Touch or any of the upcoming headsets. Um, the Foo Show is something where we take people and put them inside video games, uh, with the people who make the games, so we can talk about making games from inside the games. It kind of spins off of what I did it tested before we started Foo. Um, uh, everybody watched this on YouTube, it turns out. We had like 100,000 downloads across all the platforms, but the YouTube views that some guy captured off of a headset with full head bob got a, a order of magnitude more traffic. So um, I guess, think there's an important lesson about nascent platforms there, but I don't know what it is this, morning, this early in the morning. Um, I'm Will Smith, I think I got in a little bit different order. Uh, I'm not this one, I'm actually this guy. Uh, this is from my time at Tested. Uh, at Tested, we, the thing that we did, the thing that was really compelling was we went out and found people who made amazing things on all sorts of scales, from a guy in his garage making Wall-E robots that actually drove around and were fully articulated, to um, you know cooking for the International Space Station with Chris Hadfield, to just testing goofy stuff in the office in San Francisco. Um, we talked to the people who made these things in a way that was very relatable to other people who make things and people who are aspirational. The challenge with it was it was only really good for tangible things. Video is great if I can point at something, I can say, oh, why did you make Wally's head work this way? Why, did, why does this juicer have a feed like this? If we wanted to talk to people who make games or other intangible 3D, you know, digital assets, it, you know, it's kind of boring. Like, like hackers kind of did this thing, but really nobody wants to watch a video of somebody sitting in front of a computer typing ever. It's really boring. So uh, that was kind of the impetus for the Foo Show. I wanted to be able to take these intangible assets that people created for games and science and all these other mediums and, and have those same kind of conversations with the creators inside those spaces. Um, and that's what we do. We make these intangible places feel like they're real with virtual reality. Um, so what what have we learned so far uh, for human animation believable? It's much much more Im important to you know We're never gonna get one-to-one -one tracking with three points of data, right? The thing that we learned incredibly early is that if you hold your hand out the hand orientation we can get But if your forearm in VR doesn't line up with your forearm in the real real world a lot of people get really really discomforted by that and it's something to be avoided um, avatars actually work the the when we first, when we recorded the first episode with the Firewatch creators, uh, 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 Sean Vanham and, and Jake Rodkin from Campo Santo, I didn't know if you were gonna be able to interview somebody with avatars. Like, we literally put the headset on for the first time and we'd use the technology a lot in house, but we'd all spent hours and hours and hours testing this and we were familiar with the avatars. We were used to their body language. We were comfortable with them. And the first five or six minutes of the Firewatch recording, we, it was unclear if we were going to have the kind of human interaction that we have when we're looking each other in the eye and you kind of read the body language that, that, that comes across when you're having a conversation with somebody. Um, th that's the other interesting thing is that the body language actually does come across even with only three points of data. So when I shrug, I get that reads much better in VR than it does even on a Skype call or something like that. If I'm tilting my head, like I want more of a question, you know, I, want, I want more more detail on the thing that the other person's talking about in conversation, they can pick up on that and they'll give me that. If I'm moving my hand as if I want to interrupt, they'll see that too. And all these things get lost in, in video, but they're present in VR. And when you're doing, interviewing somebody, when you're talking to someone, whatever, it all transfers. Um, when you're building these VR worlds, I think we'll talk about this more in a minute, but, but being deliberate about what you make real and what you make magical is super, super important. You want the real stuff to behave very predictably and, and follow a, a set of rules that are, they don't have to be set in stone, but they, they need to be internally consistent with the rest of the thing that you're building. Um, and then on top of that, we layer some VR magic. So we do 
um, what we call diegetic UIs. They're, they're basically, it's a pop-up menu that's a device that lives in the world. And, and instead of you know, blasting up a big 2D pane with UX on it, or UI on it, we give people a thing that they can interact with that's a, basically physical widgets. Um, and it's important to kind of use that stuff sparingly. Uh, when you're doing a social thing, like our recording studio, if you want them to follow the rules of the real world, you know, not invading people's personal space, um, not, uh, you know, not zooming around recklessly while you're having a conversation with them, you need to, your world needs to behave enough like the real world that their reptile brain says, oh yeah, I, kn I know how to do this. I, I, I stand here and I look at this person and I nod when they say something that I agree with and I shake my head when they don't. Uh, and then the other thing that we learned relatively early on is that the VR audience, uh, at least in the first year or so, wasn't big enough to pay the bills, uh, even for a small three-person studio. So um, we started doing some other stuff. Uh, we used our animation tech to make a live weekly television show. Uh, or it's, it's digital, but it's a, essentially a 30-minute sports call-in show that features Carl from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. He takes your Skype calls every Wednesday night at 7. <laughs> Uh, and he talks about football. He loves the Giants and hates everyone else, basically. Um, we've also done some commercial work, and we've done a couple of other pilots that I can't really talk about. Um, but, but it turns out building a virtual reality animation studio that works like a live television studio, it, it, it empowers the people who make traditional animation in really interesting new ways. Um, and then I have what's next. Um, so, uh, we're continuing to work on the animation. It turns out taking three points of data and turning that into a believably animated uh, human is challenging and difficult. Uh, we get a little bit better every version. I think we're on like the 10th or 12th version of our core software now. Um, the 2D content pays the bills. That It turns out it's nice to have food and, and a house. Um, but we still believe in the future of VR despite the fact that we're making using VR to make 2D video. Um, I think that the upcoming wave of hardware that's coming, the price reductions that we've seen earlier this year, uh, and the standalone headsets that we'll see next year are, are making, you know, VR, AR, MR, whatever you want to call it. It's it's all it's all still a super relevant thing and really exciting, and the, the place that we want to be. And the stuff that we're doing for 2D actually will spill over into into the the, the VR adjacent stuff. Um, and and we really believe that the current gen desktop hardware dev kits for the future, right? I, I think that the standalone headsets are going to be huge in two years. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. The, um, the last thing I'll say is that, that don't get hung up on labels, just make stuff that you think is cool. So VR, MR, AR, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just make, make cool games and things. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Chris. Hello, good morning. Uh, I have a policy about slides with text uh, that I don't like them. And I made these slides, um, and I sent them over to Adam about a week ago. And I'm like, hey, what do you think of the slides? And he said, yeah, yeah, they're fine. This will be fine. And then, you know, a couple of days ago, he's like, well, you know, I'm having some trouble fitting them into the template. Because uh, we have a really impressive slide template here. Uh, and then last night, we had dinner. Stop using the template because of your slides. Because my slides. I broke the template. <laughs> then last night, we had dinner, and he's like, I, I got to tell you something. Uh, I had to rewrite your slides as text. And I was like, <clears throat> so I'm going to bring to you these slides that, uh, that I drew with a pen um, that I forced Adam at gunpoint to reinsert into this deck last night at about 11 p.m. So I hope that you enjoy them. Um, so my name is Chris Pruitt. I am an employee at Oculus. My job there is working with folks like yourself, third-party developers. Uh, I run an engineering team that helps folks like yourself, you know, optimize your code or design your games or do whatever it is you need to do to make your content really good. Uh, under the cover of Night, I'm also a game developer. Uh, I founded a studio called Robot Invader in 2011. That studio continues to run, and my role these days is sort of to <laughs> paw through the code at night and introduce bugs. Uh, Robot Invader produced a game called Dead Secret, uh, which I was the designer for. Uh, this shipped in, its very first version shipped on Gear VR in 2015. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it a lot today, but it's essentially a murder mystery horror game. takes place in 1965. Um, so here's a slide about Dead Secret. And the important part of this slide is that you should, see that you should go to deadsecret.com to find out about the next game, which is called Dead Secret Circle, which is currently in development. OK, so what I, the reason I'm interested in uh, VR worlds is that I actually want to scare you. 
I'm interested in making all of you quake in your boots. Uh, and the reason that I'm interested in horror games uh, is really long and complicated, and I'm going to get as much of it as I can in like the 30 seconds I have left. I started studying horror games about 15 years ago. Uh, these were not VR games. These are just you know, regular horror games. And my theory at the time was that horror games are interesting and they're different than other types of titles because they are going for emo emotional manipulation. If you're building a horror game, you have a very, very specific goal, and that is to make your players feel a very, very specific thing, which is generally stress or tension. Uh, and that's more specific than most other types of games. Most other types of games are like, oh, I feel great. I'm having a good time. My, the adrenaline is running. I'm a, you know, sp I'm a space ninja or whatever it is. But horror games are like, no, no, I'm going to make you concerned about what's behind that door right at this moment. Uh, and that's a very specific type of design, and I was really interested in that, uh, that concept. I spent a long time working on it. I don't really care when I say horror games about like jump scares or monster closets. What I care about is an environment that over the course of experiencing that environment, you are worried about. You become unsettled by. And actually what I'm going for is what horror game designers have been calling sense of presence for a lot longer than we've had VR. The idea of presence in VR I think is very well understood. You're in the world, you believe you're in the world, the world is self-consistent, you, you, you know, accept that you're there. And in, outside of VR, horror game designers work really, really, really super hard to produce that. And in VR, it's almost automatic. And that means that a, a scary game, or a game, even if it's not scary, that's built on the same principles as a horror game in VR, has the ability to speak intimately at an emotional level with its player uh, really, really easily in a way that other, other types of experiences do not. And that is super fascinating to me. Um, my goal is to get you to stop thinking about the game as a collection of mechanics. When I play a video game, uh, I played a lot of video games, and I kind of can see through the mechanics a lot of the times, and I'm like, oh, you know, like the health pack gives me three health points back, but if I take a hit, then I only take one point, so I can take two hits before I have to use a health pack, and then I got to ration the health pack because, you know, I have to do three more guys before I get to the boss, and he's going to hit me harder. And, and I'm, that's like solving a Rubik's Cube, and that's fun, and I enjoy it because Rubik's Cubes are pretty good. But when you're playing a horror game, what I want you to think about is, you know, what is the significance of that symbol that I just saw on the wall? I'm pretty sure I've seen that symbol somewhere before. Maybe the killer left that signal. I want you to think about the context. I want you to think about the story and the environment, and that is entirely built out of what I call contextual thinking rather than systemic thinking, which is normal for a regular video game. Uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. And uh, I'm going to cut it off there, because Adam said he'd kill me if I go more than five minutes. Uh, but, but that's my piece. Thank you. OK. Uh, I need the mic gun. Is this on? Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, so when I put this, uh, the idea of this panel together, I, I'm, I was going through a period where I was just like working on a new thing, and the environment was not working in VR. It, it, was, uh, it's, it was something that was kind of set in the real world that you can actually go to and experience in real life, and I just found it wasn't clicking for me and I started thinking a lot about environments and and I wanted to talk about it and I wanted to talk about it um, specifically with these guys because they're my friends but I also really respect um, what they've done in VR so I wanted to have just um, even though they're kind of rote at this point but the um, the idea of transportation um, not locomotion but being transported somewhere um, presence and immersion um, those they, those things have been talked about to death but the kind of interesting thing here is I want to talk about those things from through the lens of these guys experience um, you know I made a very um, narrative driven environmental uh, VR experience and I, I want to kind of hear how these guys and have you guys here of these guys think about those three words um, from making an arcade game or a VR TV show or a horror game or and especially in Chris's point from point of view as um, an employee at arguably the best uh, VR headset out there some may, some may disagree but I'm an Oculus fanboy <laughs> um, because I think I think it's interesting I think there's a lot of interesting stuff 
to be said there, especially from Chris's point of view from, you know, what does Oculus look for in, in these things? So I just want to open up. Uh, I'll, I'll start out by saying, uh, um, you know, when I was working on a drift, um, I researched a lot of, of, you know, what do these, what, what do people who go up into space, how does it make them feel? How does it feel to be able to look down on all of humanity? And they all had a really different experience and they were all very changed when they came back. But the one, the one commonality was that, um, that they, they had a sense of, of presence in the, in the universe and in space that made them feel like it changed them forever. And I wanted to kind of use VR to, to capture that um, in, a, in a narrative game. So space was like an obvious choice for me. And like I mentioned uh, just a couple minutes ago, I've, I've done some things recently where I haven't been so successful with the environment because it's not magical enough. Right, and Will brought that up a little bit. And um, well, you can either be really real or really magical, right? You don't have to be both. Sorry, I didn't mean to take your mic. No, take it. Um, but 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 yeah. So we take um, with the Fusha, we take stuff from video games, and and there were two things that we learned really quickly. One is that we have we have this opening segment that's like two and a half minutes long, where we introduce the the developers, and it's in a studio where you can teleport around a little bit. But there's literally nothing else to do but watch us talk and then watch the the clip that we play. Um, on the other the other side of that, we go into the actual environment from the game. We made all of the props that were in the in this Firewatch Watchtower interactive. So you can pick them up, you can look at them. We talk about them, we pick them up, you can grab the things that we're talking about. And the feedback, we, we, we analytics the hell out of it, which I recommend everybody do on their, on their, especially when you're experimenting with stuff. So you can see what people are touching, what they're spending time with. The feedback we got after we did play testing was, the opening part was about 10 minutes too long. It was two and a half minutes. The second part could have been twice as long, and it was 17 and a half minutes. So, you know, we, we had a 20-minute total experience. The part that was two minutes and we thought was as short as we could possibly make it was too boring. And, and you, you, like, one of the things that you did with a drift, you did two things that I loved in a drift. One was the first time you went outside the space station, I felt like an astronaut for the first time in my life. Um, you know, since since then... You know, you're floating in space. You're looking at the whole world. You can see the entirety of the world below you, and you. Uh, I understood a little bit more about the things that I'd read and all the memoirs of the astronauts I've read over the years. It's something that connected with me very personally. Um, Google Earth does a similar thing. Like when you're in space, looking at Google Earth, you get that same kind of feeling. Um, but but you also gave the people lots of stuff to interact with in the world, which I think is really important. The thing that I'm curious about is with, with your game, Dirk. Like you basically, your interaction is that you can shoot stuff or grab it. And and your game is much more like I've spent way more time in your game than I have in mine, so you know I'm I'm curious. Uh, yeah, like is shooting just a core? It's, we just have to shoot as people. <laughs> is that a question? I mean, do, do we have to shoot as people? Um, uh, do you mean like uh, is, it, is this mic on? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so no, actually, you don't have to shoot. Um, but yeah, if I'm, if I, <laughs> I mean, is it a core imperative of the human experience that we have to shoot other things? I no. guess. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. One of the funny things is with 1.0. I'm going to spoil it. Uh, um, uh, you can actually finish Space Pirate 1.0, and, and you do it by just not shooting the first droid because the first droid doesn't shoot you. So if you just hold it and caress it for a couple of minutes, you unlock the, you finish the game. So <laughs> it's, it just, it just flies away. So if you ever want to unlock it, don't tell your friends. They go mad that you finished the game. <laughs> So you don't have to shoot as a human. It's okay. because you, you uh, I really wanted to do that. You, I, uh, you start the aggression, so that's when they start shooting at you. That's why, why the first droid is not shooting at you. So I, people were wondering why that was. <laughs> it's also easy, the first droid's just shoot, not shooting. Uh, but the interaction part, uh, with, the, with the Volton, we saw that uh, in, in, in virtual environments, people uh, tend to try everything or try to interact with everything. You, you saw it like in Job Simulator in a lot of games. They try to do random stuff and the best way to figure out what people will be doing is just to play test your environment. Uh, I think the guys from Alchemy Labs, they, they just put people in there and they start throwing stuff or shaking the bottle and they said, ah, oh, maybe it should like, 
actually spray or something if you shake it too much. So you can actually, you have to predict what people will do, but you can predict everything. And we had the same thing, for example, with the Volton, like you could actually interact with objects that were far away from you. And people were trying to use it on everything around you, like they were trying to use it for the ship to move it around or you could actually use it on the grenade, for example. You could pull them back. Uh, so uh, one of my, the new things with, with was creating more interaction around you in, in your world. And, and by creating more interactivity, it also makes it more believable, I guess. And uh, you spend a lot of time on details that people will probably not see, but it just makes all of it more believable. That's a good uh, segue for Chris, because uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in that house. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, one of the nice things about VR, as you alluded to, Adam, is that there's, it's new and there's no real rules and nobody really knows what the rules should be. Uh, particularly, you know, if we're talking about core video games, you know, if you're making a first person shooter in this day and age and it's a core video game, like you don't have a lot of choices when it comes to like how the character's gonna move or what the action button is gonna be. Like those things are baked as precedent. You, you can't mess with them or players won't understand how to play your game. Uh, but in VR, like you know, all bets are off. Nobody knows how to like shoot a robot. Maybe, maybe you should grab it with a, you know, gravity thing first. Like, like the the grammar is unwritten, and in particular, you have an opportunity with each new world to write your own grammar. I think the trick is that once you define that, like this is what the interaction grammar, this is the rules of your world, they have to remain consistent. So, the thing that is great about Space Pirate Trainer is that you can do all that stuff. Uh, you know, you can use the objects in a way that you didn't expect people to use. It's also true of, of Job Simulator. They're saying, I'm going to give you a very high fidelity interaction here. We have a lot of, we've got these hands, we've got a lot of physics interactions. Um, and then all the stuff that you might think to do is going to totally work because we, we coded it to work. You're like, you want to put your head in the, in the photocopy machine? We thought of that. There's something going to, like, so when we did Dead Secret, you know, this was pretty early. We didn't have... We have motion controllers. We were building originally, you know, although it ended up shipping everywhere, building originally for a mobile device. So, you know, we had like a trackpad and a click. We didn't really have very high fidelity input. Uh, so we went the other direction. We actually kept the interaction super duper simple because I didn't want the, the rules or the believability of the world to be broken by sort of an inconsistent rule set. If I say, um, you know, well, you can pick up that object, but you can't pick up that object. Or you can throw that one, but not that one because we couldn't figure out how do you should throw that one, then it will feel like a system again. I don't want to feel like a system. I want to feel like a scary house where somebody got killed. So, so when you talked about um, earlier, you talked about, oh, you know, the symbol on the wall, right? Um, when you first go into that house, it's so well put together in terms of that, like, it feels like a character. That's the place felt like a character. So what were, like, the... Point out just a couple things um, for those who've played Dead Secret um, that were really key into sure. making that magic there. The char yeah, the house, I mean, is the character, and very specifically, it's the character of the guy who's died. So the, the setup is that, you know, you're investigating this, this murder that's occurred, and nobody believes it's murder except for you, and you've got, like, you're going to break in there and find the evidence and blow it wide open, right? And you kind of get into the house and figure out that it's, you know, significantly more complicated than you might have imagined. Um, the very first scene is that you step into the, the sort of foyer and there's a mirror and you can see yourself in the mirror. Uh, and this was like a pain in the ass engineering wise to do properly because it's hard to render mirrors. Uh, you render, end up rendering the scene four times, right? Once for each eye and then once for each reflection. Um, and I'm running this on a mobile device in 2015. So like I've worked a ton to make that freaking mirror work, but it was important I because- think everyone should give Chris a round of applause for that because that's really hard yeah. to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I spent like an inordinate amount of engineering time on that stupid mirror, but the reason was you had to be able to see who your character was. And once you step into this space, you're going to be immersed in this other dude's life. That's what, his, that's what his house is. It's a record of his life. And he had a weird or messed up life. And I have very, very few opportunities to tell you about your character. And your character in, in my game is not you, and it's not an every man. It's a very specific person. Um, and she has very specific traits, and some of them I'm never going to tell you about. Like, she's got a broken arm, and I'm not going to tell you why. But you need to see that she has a broken arm, so you know something about her. And so I, I, you know, it was really important for me to design the house such that I could do that very early on. Once you get past that foyer point, you are into 
um, sort of the house itself. And what we did was we, we went for a small, a physically small space. I mean, the whole game takes place in one house that is high density in terms of detail. Uh, so there's a zillion documents to read. There's, you know, you can look under the covers or you can, you can pull up the, the futon uh, or the, the, the couch um, pillows and look underneath them. You know, the, we tried to make sure that there was a reason to investigate every little area. Um, because if you do that, again, I think you're going to be thinking about this, thinking in context rather than thinking about a system. But also, you're going to be focused and you'll be a really close reader. And if my goal is to scare you, uh, then once you're you focused, I have a lot of opportunities to do that. So Dirk, one of the, one of the things I love about Space Pirate Trainer is the first time I played it, I grew up in the 80s, so you know, arcade games and all that. And it really felt like a natural evolution to that. And I just remember like, feeling like it was a real place, like not just like an arcade experience, like looking out in the vistas and like the Blade Runner-esque kind of ads and stuff up top. Like, like how, did you, how did you decide to go to that place? Because I think that for me that, that sells the, the virtual environment and it, it makes Space Pirate Trainer better and more unique than everyone else who copied it. Uh, that's actually the look. <laughs> that's actually the look where we were going for because I just remembered when I was first playing VR games. I just remembered the times that I was at, at an arcade and playing those games, and I just wanted to have that same kind of feeling. I think the coloring in the in the Space Pirate Trainer, like the broken red and stuff, it's one of the reasons why it feels a bit 80-ish. Uh, the first time I actually imported the whole uh, model of the building into Space Pirate Trainer, uh, we thought it looked great uh, on, on my computer and in the level designer, but when we saw it in real life in VR, we actually noticed that um, there's a lack of detail. Like sometimes if you, if you create something for the first time in, in VR and, and you look at things in a different way, for example, the ground floor under you, it could look nice in your level editor, but you're so close to the ground that it needs extra detail. So we spend most of the time, uh, most of the time uh, on, on detailing everything that's very close to you. So the first thing people do when they're in VR and they, uh, they're holding an object, like for example in our in our uh, in space spectrum our gun, they actually look at that, at it very closely. So we spend a lot of time just modeling the gun because it just uh, gives you a seal of quality. If something in your hand that you're looking up close is high quality. So the closer things get to your, to your face, the more uh, time you, spend, you should spend on, on making uh, something that's high fidelity in terms of quality. Same with, for example, the floor. Uh, make sure there's uh, detailed texturing and stuff in there. It's just tiny details that, that makes it feel more realistic. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have played uh, uh, Lone Echo, for example. Um, it's, it's very AAA. Uh, it's probably one of next to uh, Adam Swan and uh, Robo Recall. It's one of the big AAA titles. And you can see, if you just take a look at the way they did the locomotion, the hands, like it actually grabs around stuff and the detail they put into the hands, it just gives you an immersion immediately. I think having stuff with high quality very close to you and stuff with less quality a bit further away, it just makes the whole experience better. You just have to, uh, the first, the most things you do in VR just needs, like, it just needs, the first time you put an environment in VR, you always feel it needs more, uh, more, needs more detail, in my opinion. So. And of course, Will, uh, with the Foo Show, like, he's got the best of all worlds, no pun intended, because he gets to go into all these other worlds and, and have an experience in them that they weren't created for. And I, Can I ask you a question I, about that, actually? Yeah. I a question. So I really liked going to the Firewatch Tower mm -hmm. and playing with it. And I think that the setup was that you're talking to the developers of the game and they're talking about how they modeled the assets and you're looking at them, but also kind of turned the world into a set, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how did you feel about that? Like, it, because once you can pick the things up and they have, you know, oh look, it has no back or it has no weight. Uh, you know, there's no attempt to make it realistic. You're just showing the. the assets, we're, we're showing right? props. We're showing right. what, what it's like to go on Warner's back lot, basically. Yeah. How does that? Was that intentional? How do you feel about that? Um, I'd like to say it was intentional, but it really, we recorded that episode, I think, on March 3rd, <laughs> and we released it. The the let's see, it came out on the Vive on launch day, and it came out on Oculus the Friday after launch. 
So like that was maybe three weeks of development basically from the time we recorded. Like we recorded as a test to see if we could if we could do the recordings, right? And then we shared shared it around to some friends. I sent it to some folks all over, and people looked at it and were like, "This is you should release this. This is really good." And we're like, "Well, it's it's like it's like ten days until the the <laughs> headsets are out. I don't know if we can." And they're like, "You know, you should really release it." So we so we we hunkered down, and a lot of the decisions we made in that were not intentional, right? So things like, do we give the phys- we 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 knew that we wanted everybody to be able to look at the same object at the same time without having to huddle around each other, because then we knew it would feel cramped. So we we let them spawn clones, but if we let them spawn clones, and conceivably somebody could just make a million clones of the same object and fill the tower with garbage and chunk their performance and make them and and feel nauseous. So like the the most of our decisions at that point were around making it a pleasant experience for the viewer and making it, letting you access the things that maybe you couldn't reach if you were on an Oculus with a gamepad at the time sure. and didn't have room scale. Um, so we, we had like a force pull thing where you could grab stuff from across the room, which, which worked surprisingly well. Our teleport system was very rudimentary. All, all of that stuff was rough, but, but the benefit we had is that we drafted on you know, something that a really talented team of like eight people had spent two and a half years making. Um, it turns out that bringing assets from other engines into Unity is a little more challenging than we initially anticipated. Um, but but yeah, we the other benefit that we've had is we can go places that don't exist in the real world. This is this is one of the important things. Is like if you're gonna like everybody loads up that that 360 video of the top of Mount Everest once and it's like oh man this is the top of Mount Everest this is cool for f- literally 45 seconds and then you're like it's kind of low resolution I, I'm done I'm good and you never load that up again. Um, we wanted to build something that people would want to come back to over and over again. So, like one of the episodes that's in production right now is uh, I talked to a, a, a biochemist who makes nanomachines out of DNA, and we literally start out in his lab, which he's recreated for reasons I'm not going to get into here because he's he's awesome and a little bit crazy. Um, and then we we do a powers of ten thing. We go inside the equipment in the lab, and then we go into a microscopic scale world. And then eventually we end up and we finish the episode standing between the lipid layers of an E. coli cell. And that's a thing you can't do in the real world. Like like you just you can't see it. We can see the constructs. We can see the way that he builds the nanomachines with these phage viruses. And and you can handle the phages, and you can see how the stuff chunks together. And that's something you can't do in any other medium that I'm aware of, which is what we're trying to do. So, so that's coming out soon. So do you guys agree? I want you to agree. Because <laughs> it's something, like I said, I've been having issues with it. Like, like when you make a place in VR, like it can't just be a normal place. It has to have these some kind of magical quality in it. I mean, it could be a place that doesn't, it could be a place that's inaccessible. Like I would love to spend some time in the Oval Office and kind of like walk around and see see what it's like, or in the, the a missile silo or places that aren't places that are right, you but, know but International like, Space Station. That but, Oculus thing was amazing. But the the Oval Office is kind of like space, though. It's well, not yeah. some place you can normally go. Right. Right. So that, I mean that's magical in that sense, I guess. Right. Right. Because I made a gas station and it was really terrible. Is like, <laughs> do, like, do you get to do, you, do like the kids that are going off to to Chris's house like roll up into the RV and they're like, hey guys, what's and you're the grumpy old man that has to send them on their way to their doom. Yeah, I mean, like, well, I, I just wanted to feel what it would be like to go to some place in VR that I could just walk down the street and go to. How just, th- uh, I can see how that wouldn't work. Yeah, out. it just didn't work, but I had to do it, and you know, now I know. I think, uh, I th- now everyone knows. If you create stuff that people already know, you see a lot more detail because you know how it should look and how it should feel like. It's the same thing if you're visiting stuff like uh, a certain church that they pho- in photogrammetry, for example. It's great because if you've never been there, you can actually see it and you go, maybe you can go to places that aren't available for a public. But if you actually have been there and you remember the smell and the sound of it, there's just something different that you feel like you're losing something. It's like a shadow. So that's, that's why you have to yeah. show stuff that like that that, that you haven't experienced yet in well, our environment. I mean, the same thing applies. Like we realized that early on with the avatars too. If you try to make you like our avatars, the animation's pretty janky. Um, but if you put it in a cell shaded context, or you put it in a low poly context, the people's brains forgive a lot of the 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 errors that come with doing procedural animation live. Um, it turns out there's a fair number, and it's a challenging thing. Yeah, we had the same thing with, for example, the Space Pirate Trainer guns. They don't have hands. I had a lot of comments about that. And the reason why I didn't put hands in it is because it's very hard to, to know. Uh, 
next to the to the arm thing, it's very hard to know where the fingers are. And if you're, it just breaks the illusion if it's not like correct. And there's probably there are ways to handle this with the new controllers because you're actually they are checking uh, what what you're holding. But some stuff like that breaks the illusion. But it's still just inferred from other data. It's not measuring one to one, which yeah. is kind of what you want for that. Yeah. All right, this is a, a good time for us to open up uh, for Q and A. If I anyone's, one, one more oh yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about all visual stuff now time. about environments, uh, but there's, uh, I believe there's a lot more. Uh, for example, uh, don't un underestimate stuff like first feedback and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and audio. Don't, audio uh, is super important. Like those two things I actually spend a lot of time on all the first feedback and space and It's one of the reasons why it feels good. Uh, because we every every type of gun has its own kind of uh, force feedback curve, and so people actually feel which gun they're shooting, even if they're shooting blindly without sound. Uh, same thing with audio. If you even even Space Factory, if there's no music at all, there's still this environmental sound and just dips you in the whole environment. It's super important that that the, the thing combined makes makes the whole experience and it makes the whole environment look so much better just because of this extra impulses. I'm going to go on record and say I think for a believable <coughs> environment, audio is more important than your visuals. Uh, it, properly yeah. done audio with spatialization and in a good, you know, with the user having headphones, you know, with, with, with no friction there, uh, you can you can sell an environment with a black screen. Yeah, no no argument there for sure. If you close your eyes and just have some audio of a forest, which which you actually are there already, and then the visuals come next. We we should totally should have done that on the Firewatch episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone have any questions? There's a, uh, I guess there's a mic there. Other people can hear. Would you like to? There's a microphone. Yeah, there's a microphone. <coughs> I have a question for Will Smith. This Hello. Is, maintains a particular interest of mine. I'm wondering if you're working with, or I thought of working with embryologists, so, I, so that we could relive our journey from conception to birth inside the womb, so, and have that be very, very real for us. Um, I haven't, but if you know anybody who has 3D assets that they've built, then connect me and I'll talk to them, because it sounds like that would be fun. Hey, Thanks. this question's for Chris. Um, we heard from the others about their thoughts on, you know, representations of the mundane world and, you know, with all your kind of ideas about language and, you know, the language of VR and, you know, stuff like that. I was wondering, you were the only one that didn't answer that and I was wondering <laughs> what, what your take on the role of the representations of the mundane would be. Um, I think that Adam's assessment is correct, which is that there needs to be a reason for the environment to be interesting. I mean, we could, we, it's true if we write a book. If I write like a, a very, you know, well, well, if I was to write something that's, uh, you know, a, a great description of a gas station, you may still not want to read it. It has to have something, there has to be a reason for it to exist. You know, my game is probably, in terms of locale, the most mundane of, of the folks we have up here. It's just a, a farmhouse in Kansas. Um, but it try to make it interesting by having things that happened in it or the objects in it be out of place or have objects or, or th things about it that, that the viewer can't immediately understand uh, so that there's, a, there's a, a story that's waiting there. It's like a thread that they're going to have to pull out. And it's actually okay that the environment is, itself is sort of a, a relatable place. In fact, it's important to me to, for that particular game for you to be able to believe that this could happen to you. Uh, we chose a non-realistic art style. It's not super cartoony, but we didn't, realism wasn't a, something we corrected for. Um, because I actually think if the sound is right and if the sort of the world is consistent, even if the location is, is sort of generally mundane, if there's something there, I think that's what Adam's talking about when he says magic. If there's something there, a reason for you to be there, a reason for you to explore that world, then um, that is, that's why you're there. And the, all the world really has to do is reinforce that and be consistent. Thanks. Hi there. Um, I'm Dave Cox. I'm a journalist. Um, about 30 years ago, Geron Laney used to uh, hold uh, fantastic uh, VR classes uh, at the universities around town. And uh, the, the technology was very modest. It was low-end Macs, usually Mac classics, running simple you know, 3D packages. But they were VR classes. And a lot of the point he was raising in his lectures 
and workshops had to do with a kind of uh, attempt to identify, you know, he, what he what he was looking for was a kind of universal language of communication within VR, um, akin to he called it body music, a kind of you know body language communicated through simple gestures over a distance, you know, a little bit like HTML and the web were an attempt to universalize text over a distance, right? Um, and you know, because universal ways of communication were the common thread in the early 90s. And VR looked to be, at that time, uh, another branch of that attempt to universalize communication at a distance, except the ontology was one of continuous movement, right? So with VR, you have this, the 360 experience, but also the gestures of the person, right? Um, there seems to be a tension now between an attempt to standardize this stuff because the technology is standardized and the delivery mechanisms are increasingly commercialized and standardized. What are your views on that kind of legacy of the language of VR as a 30, 40, 50 year uh, set of research inquiries you know, in relation to now? Well, I'll just say one quick thing about that is we shouldn't be standardizing anything right now. Um, it's too early. It, it's, it's, I mean, we're, we're essentially in like 1905 yeah. with film right now. <laughs> right. We, we, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I don't think, I think that the pace at which the technology related to VR is going to continue to dramatically change is pretty fast. I mean, we are a year and a half out from the very first commercial headsets. Uh, the, you know, Oculus's touch controller shipped less than a year ago. We, there's a lot of, sort of obvious technology that doesn't exist at a commercialized level today, like maybe we should track your face. What if we knew your expressions? Or what if we knew where your shoulders were doing? Maybe we could what, render a thing. What if we know where you're looking in the headset? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I feel like there are a number of sort of, I don't want to call them low-hanging fruit, but clearly achievable in the next couple of years sort of technologies that could significantly change the way that we express ourselves in a virtual space and the fidelity of those expressions. So I think that probably the things that we see today are, are only uh, very vague footsteps in, that, in the direction towards what you're talking about. The, the thing I'd say is that the, the standard is going to be what you can do with your human body, not what Facebook says we can do or what Valve says we can do or what, whatever. I agree. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, there's a few virtual worlds popping up that are based on user-generated content, and I was wondering what mistakes you think a user might make when they're building an environment, and what tools you think users need to make virtual environments that don't suck. I mean, they'll make the same mistakes we made, right? <laughs> you, just, you just try stuff, and you put your friends in it, and they tell you that this makes them feel bad, or they like this, and you just keep iterating until you find something that works. The, the I mean, maybe thing, uh, these guys have smarter answers. Well, no, I mean, I think you're, I mean, the tricky thing about comfort is that we can, we can meet a certain level of comfort for a large percentage of people just by having good hardware. And we have a lot of good hardware now. But that's actually not enough to make all experiences comfortable. In fact, there's a huge swath of experiences like Half-Life, for example, that even on good hardware, it's going to make everybody sick. Um, so what you don't see in the final product is that all the things that you know we tried in the production and that made people sick we cut because we don't want to make people sick so there are and there's just like super fascinating differences between the way that people uh, feel uh, discomfort I had a, a person tell me in early development of Dead Secret that they were not uncomfortable because I'd placed them too close to a wall <laughs> and they felt that they were you know their, their shoulders should be touching the wall where they couldn't feel it and that made them feel bad yeah I um, mean like I, I think that users who have building this stuff for, for the first time, we'll just go through that same learning curve and you'll have a lot of content that you cannot guarantee is, is comfortable. And the folks who are consuming that have to be sort of okay with that. If you're not susceptible to motion sickness, it's really good to have somebody on your team like Dirk who is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean, Sorry, I think Will, Will was on point by saying you're gonna make all the mistakes. Like we built and deleted a drift three times before we finished it. <laughs> like, it just, it didn't work because it was new. So um, it's amazing to have all the tools and it's amazing that people are out there making VR, but they're just going to have to 
suck it up and make mistakes because that's how you find the good stuff peering around in the dark and then accidentally figuring something out and that's what's awesome about VR I think with user generated content you're limiting uh, you're actually um, what they're Probably the most common use is just creating levels and stuff, or mm -hmm. creating. But most of the interactivity uh, or the, uh, the the core thing is already uh, programmed. So um, I think uh, even for believing in a realistic world, uh, it's all about these small interactive things and the way you push a button and stuff. So that's already done by the developer. So we already made those mistakes. If you're creating user-generated content, you're just going to create some mistakes concerning environments, but not the art direction design because that's what's already done by developers. So I think it's uh, like it's just part of the mistakes that the developer made. <laughs> just, we, got, yeah. we got time for one final question. Thank you. That was a good question. Hello. Um, this question aroused when um, Quark Cannon was speaking, <laughs> um, but anyone can answer it. Uh, you were talking about how you have to change the view of action and going on in front of you and behind you. When is it appropriate or what type of games uh, would it be appropriate to have action going on behind you? Guess is my question. Yeah, if if you're, uh, it depends on how overwhelming something is. Uh, how if you put someone in a game and and they and you use a lot of audio cues, for example, uh, where the user should look at, for, then you can try to implement some 360. The problem is, uh, people you don't you don't know where people will be looking at. So even when I put uh, people into spacebar trainer, they can't find the menu because sometimes it's behind them. Uh, so the, you have to direct the user where they're looking at. And if you're creating, a, you, you could do 360 experiences of course but you have to show the p show the the user where to look at and uh, we do it for example in uh, when we're opening up the angle for enemies for example like at first they just come in a like in the 60 degrees of field angle but it, they open up uh, throughout the waves like they get further and further away and so one of the problems where if you weren't using audio and it wasn't loud enough you actually weren't looking at where the droid was shooting from and so we implemented a system that was uh, flashing the right side of your HMD so you had uh, glow there and then you actually felt like oh there's something happening that part and you look around so these are all cues that can be helpful for creating uh, experiences that are more like a uh, 360 and not 180 so it's about uh, audio visual cues most of the time all right uh, I want to thank everyone for coming I want to thank Dirk and Will and Chris for agreeing to do this with me Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks, guys. And thank you for coming. Don't forget to uh, fill out your evaluations and have fun in VR. We enjoy VRDC.